Hey everybody, welcome back. This is lecture number 23, and this one's a little bit of a mishmash. So I'm going to try to walk us through a bunch of different problems that we can find in machine learning, things that are of practical and important nature that are not the kind of technical theoretical stuff that we've been covering so far. Okay, so uh, those topics are going to include uh, things about how data is you get how you get the data and how you process it and how you understand it and also procedures of analyzing and creating models and finally the considerations of ethics and accountability okay so without too much further ado let's just get into it because i've got to go pick up a kid in an hour so i'd better be done by then okay so we're going to start off with errors of measurement so machine learning inputs are data, right? The numbers come from somewhere. Somewhere or other, there is some sort of measurement, which is the source of what you're pushing into your algorithms as an X matrix, okay? So it's important to understand the nature of those measurements, or else you might get yourself in trouble. You could end up choosing the wrong kind of model. You could end up creating a uh, a noisy version of the data when you could understand better the measurements and fix noise problems before you even send it into your algorithm. Okay, these are examples. So making sure that you understand the nature of the measurement and what it what is being represented in these numbers is key. All right, so you might have measurements that are, you know, accurate and precise. Those are clearly what you would like but the measurements might also have different sources of noise in them. Those noises might be random noises, right? Where the, like in the middle case of this target, where the center of the distribution is good, but the spread is bad, right? It's accurate, but it's not precise. Or it might be that it has a systematic error, that the measurement is always under measuring something, right? in the case of like a, a bathroom scale, which is not doing so good, that, you know, it isn't teared right, okay? It might be precise in the sense that it's repeatable if the person gets on the scale again and again, they get roughly the same number plus or minus a small amount, but it's not accurate because the scale is off overall, okay? When you understand what your inputs are before you build a model with it, you can potentially correct for systematic errors or average things out to get at, you know, variation, things of that nature. So it's important to understand your data before you address the problem. Um, another interesting thing is that you have to think about why is this even your variable in the first place? Okay, the story of the, uh, the drunkard search is um, so a cop is walking his beat, and at some point he comes across a person on his hands and knees trying to, you know, search around for something. And the cop naturally asks this person, what are you doing there on your hands and knees? He realizes the person is kind of thrashed and, and a little bit out of it with uh, too much drink. And this person answers that I'm, I'm looking for my house key. I can't get in my house because I've lost my key. So the cop takes pity on the drunkard, helps him look. They have to spend minutes and minutes, they can't find anything. And eventually the cop says, are you sure you lost your keys here? And the drunk person says, well, no, I lost them in the park over there, but that's, that's dark over there, there's no lights. I'm gonna look here where the light is. But I'm tish. Right, so there's a reason I'm not a comedian. But the point is, is that we often find that we look where the light is rather than where the important thing is, right? It's easy. Sometimes we use inputs because they are the easy measurements to get, not because they are the measurements that most accurately could capture the thing that we want to capture, okay? So just because we can measure it doesn't mean we should care about it. And just because we can't measure it doesn't mean it's not important. 
And that's what the principle of the drunkard search, the streetlight effect, is all about. When you build models, you should consider what do you really need in order to make this model? It might be that in the end, your best option would be to go out and generate a new data set yourself with the thing you really, really want to measure. Or it may be the fact that you're willing to accept a compromise and just go out and get data which is not the best data, but hey, it's readily available and you know we're just going to see what we can get out of it with our predictions. But be aware in that last case, what you end up with might not be what you expect. Your machine learning algorithm can very likely end up learning something totally different than you expect and overfitting this noisy data and not doing well with the problem you really care about. We also need to understand not just, you know, why we are making a measurement, like in the street light effect, but do we, do we really know what the variable is that we are looking at? Okay. This apocryphal story comes from the famous statistician Wald, who in the 40s was consulted with by the uh, American Army Air Force, right, trying to say, hey, we have the situation. Our bombers come back with these holes in them like this, and we want to know what it means. What, what we're assuming is, is that, you know, the military believed that they should put the armor where those bullet holes were, because that's where the bombers are getting hit. So armoring an airplane is a terrible idea because airplanes don't, you know, like they want to be light in order to work well. So putting heavy armor plating on them is you want to do it as little as possible. So when they consulted with Wald, he realized that in fact, they had it 180 degrees wrong. Really, what you're seeing here is something called survivorship bias. Okay, so the airplanes that were coming home with bullet holes in them were the ones that were coming home. The ones that were not coming home were the ones that were taking bullet hits in this region. Those were the ones that were crashing. So what you're seeing here is not the places you should armor, but you're actually seeing the places you don't need armor because the airplane can survive the hit. And these are the ones that you need to armor. Okay. So moral of the story is make sure you understand what your measurement is. You might be surprised uh, and be structuring your algorithm and learning setup wrong. Um, as we mentioned with the drunkard search, you might not be measuring what's really relevant. To give you an example that maybe hits close to home, if you look in, you know, the college rankings from U.S. News and World Report, uh, you see here that it looks like San Diego's, UC San Diego's average class size is maybe just a smidgen over 20 students. So I wish I could sit here and ask you all in live session how big you think the average class size is at UCSD given your experience. I bet if you think back about the classes that you've been in, you might say a number that was a lot closer to 100 as the average class size. Why do I think that, right? Are these, are these college, you know, admissions reports lying? Are they just making data up? No, what they're reporting is a number you don't care about. Reporting the average class size does not indicate the average experience of a student. That's the number you actually care about as somebody who's getting ready to join a college. As a student, what average class sizes will I see? Not what is the average size of a class at the whole university. What do I mean here? Well, if you get the data from uh, this random website, College Data, you can see the binning um, here, like what percent of classes are really, really tiny? What percent of classes are quite large like ours? Okay. So when you look through that and you do the cumulative sum of, you know, the percentile of the class size, you see, yes, indeed, it's kind of in like that just over 20 that we hit the median value, which is the median class size of the whole university. 
but you need to transform that into the median class size seen by a student because most students are not in the small classes. There are few classes. So, so in, a, in a class of you know, 10 students, there's not that many. In a class of 100 students, there's a lot. So from the student's point of view, from the point of view of a butt in a seat and looking around at all the other people in that room, at least during normal non-COVID times, right? What you're seeing is that most students are in the big classes. So when you renormalize that, the median student is in a 100 person class. Okay, so we weren't measuring what we cared about there. People were just naively assuming the measurement. Okay, so let's, let's use a machine learning example to show, walk you through some of the problems of measurement that we might be needing to deal with. So um, we're going to look at trying to automatically remove, bleh, remove abusive comments from YouTube. So this is going to be a binary classification task where we're going to take words as our input and we're going to uh, use a plus one for abusive and a minus one for OK. OK, so first things first we have to sample the data, right? So maybe you're familiar from your statistics class, I hope. But what we're going to do is we know that we have a huge population of comments on YouTube. And there's no way we can operate on all the comments in YouTube, at least not in this class, right? Maybe if you worked for YouTube itself. But um, that means we're going to have to draw a random sample. And we're going to have to do things on the sample that we care about. And then hopefully the sample is going to be able to have predictive power for the whole population. It's going to be able to do some inference. All right. So that if this would, if we were just doing regular statistics, this would be inference. But, you know, in machine learning land, this is really test set prediction, right? OK. What's important here? What's important is that we know that the sample is representative. If the sample is not representative, we know that we're going to have a really hard time predicting the whole population, right? OK, so that's one issue that we've got. Um, another issue that we've got is that we how do we find a good representative sample? Mm -hmm -hmm. Interesting question. OK. So uh, let's kind of take a step back before we get into that. I forgot to put this part up. Um, so if we imagine that, you know, what is the scale of this problem that we're addressing, right? Um, it's quite huge. So I found a ran, I could not find how many comments there are on YouTube or how many uh, have been removed overall. But I found this random quote on stata.com, which said that, 2 billion-ish comments had been removed due to violation in 2020 alone, second quarter. Yikes. Okay, so this really hammers home the fact that you're never going to operate on the entire population of YouTube comments, because even just the removals in a three-month period are 2 billion. Okay, um, so we're going to subsample and get 100 million comments from 2020 as our population. And now we can talk about getting a representative sample that I jumped the gun on. So what do we need to do to make sure that we can accurately predict abusive nature? We're probably going to have to operate across a range of categories. And we're going to have to use our domain knowledge of this problem to study how YouTube comments group up and make sure that we get an accurate representation across YouTube. We may have to span different linguistic groups, different languages, different dialects of languages where curse words could be different, for instance, um, different cultural aspects where in gamer land, something that you know is just a normal exchange with each other would probably be considered highly abusive in YouTube uh, videos about baking shows. 
okay? Um, the topic that things are going under falls under that category. The culture of the subgroups watching these YouTube videos, potentially the age of the person, all lead you to potentially make different judgments about uh, whether something is abusive or not, and also will lead to different kinds of comments being left that we have to study. So you can see that just creating the data set is a task all in and of itself. Okay, and this is an underappreciated aspect of machine learning. Most of the time in the real machine learning world, you're not going to UCI's repository and operating on the letters data set again, right? We want to accomplish something. So this is an underappreciated part of machine learning that we have not covered in this class to date. Okay, well, let's go on with our kind of example. So what would be the first thing, right? And I'm going to tell you a little bit about natural language processing. Um, <clears throat> this is by no means a great introduction to it. I just want to give you kind of a sense of what a big scale problem looks like. So the first thing is, is we have all this text data and we need to break it down into individual elements that we can encode for a machine learning system. Okay, so typically this is called tokenization. We take a big string and we break it down into units. Now this is maybe like it's doing this the easiest possible way is easy, right? Let's just split on white space and punctuation and get a bunch of tokens. The problem is, is that doing it well is hard and there's an infinite number of ways to do it, okay? There are here in this slide, a selection of different tokenization procedures which um, this is Twitter data. Sorry, it's what I had in my slide decks. But um, you can see already that there are different approaches to splitting up words, right? So things like this, uh, you know, we get don't get split up into a kind of a do, which is like a word root, and this NT, which is like a modifier on it, okay? We get things that do it differently and ones that operate at like the level of a word, okay? We get ones that separate out the apostrophe S and ones that keep it as part of it. Ones which parse emoji and ones which don't, right? How do they deal with things like laugh, cry? And these are just a small subset of the possible tokenization schemes that are out there. Okay, so the next step is that we need to pr probably stem words, okay? If we're trying to understand the content of um, a sentence, one of the most popular ways to do that is to just look at the total kind of concepts that are there. Because actually inferring a meaning out of a sentence in English is super, super hard, right? Understanding the, the nature of the grammatical structure and the pragmatic structure of a sentence is in general a difficult problem. So we often take the shortcut of just, hey, let's look at all the concepts involved here. We can do vocabulary kinds of things a lot better than we can do grammar or pragmatic kinds of things. For those of you that don't know your linguistics, pragmatics is um, so the grammar, so obviously the words themselves have definitions like you're used to in the dictionary. That's semantics. Grammar tells you things like, you know, I kick the cat, right? We know the cat is the subject. Sorry, the, I am the subject. I can't do linguistics. I am the subject. The cat is the object and kick is the verb that I do to the cat, right? So that's grammar. And then finally, pragmatics is stuff that is just meaning implied. It has nothing to do with anything that else with the semantics or the grammar. So an example of pragmatics is um, when I say, like the difference between me saying dude and dude and dude, right? I mean, it's all the same word. Um, 
yet those different intonations and utterances are used in different circumstances that they carry different meanings. Dude. Okay. All right, whatever. So the point is you want to get rid of that stuff. You want to get rid of grammar and, you know, all that and the pragmatics because they're hard to deal with. Um, so often we just get down to the semantics. We just get down to the words and meanings, the concepts in play, and we operate from a machine learning standpoint from that, looking at a window of words, what are the concepts involved, and that becomes my input. Well, how does that happen? First, we stem off things. We take playing and played, and we bring it down to its root form, right? We get rid of potentially irregular forms, like are and is to be, and mul multiples, plurals, and stuff like that. And we turn the boy's cars are different colors into the boy car be differ color. And that encodes the meaning potentially, at least in an, you know, in an easy to accomplish way programmatically, but in a way which absolutely will miss out on linguistic nuance. Okay. And so finally, we take those stemmed tokens, those bits and bobs that we have, and we put them into a vector. And oftentimes the nature of the vector is a one-hot encoding where for every single uh, token that's in my vocabulary list, so for this, this entire problem that we've got, we find all the unique tokens in it. So maybe we're looking at a million, maybe we're looking at a hundred thousand unique words or tokens really, because sometimes tokens are not words. Okay. And we, so we have an input vector, which is say 100,000 long. We have 100,000 unique vocabulary items. And what we do is we, we want to encode a sentence for the machine learning algorithm, the elephant sneezed at the side of potatoes. We have to put ones everywhere that we have a vocabulary element like elephant and of and potato. Note that potato is stemmed, right? We don't take potatoes, we just have potato. All right, so on and so forth. And so we could do these other sentences with, you know, wondering she opened the door to the studio. Once again, wondering gets stemmed and we would put a one at this point, right? And we would put a she one here and so on. And we would have zeros at places like elephant to encode that other sentence. Okay, finally, it's worth mentioning. So we could do all that and we get our inputs but we probably still need training labels, right? There are ways in which we would prefer to take in this class, certainly a supervised learning approach. So what are we going to have human beings sit around and tag a hundred million YouTube comments, right? I mean, that's probably what YouTube did in the beginning. Um, but at a certain point, you may want to uh, bootstrap the process you may wish to come up with an automated system that takes what you already know, takes some label training data, and can pull in new data and use another kind of learning system or maybe a fixed program system, right, which are going to generate more labeled data in an automatic fashion because, oh my gosh, this is a big problem, right? So a standard NLP task is something called sentiment analysis, where you can try to programmatically infer emotional content by looking at each one of those little words in my word vector, right? What's the, what's the statistically like, statistical likelihood of that word being an emotional word and what emotion would it capture? So this depends upon some sort of lexicon. And there exist, you know, these lexicons, which are just another word for a dictionary, right? There exist these sentiment lexicons that are out there that other people have made for a variety of uses. And it's going to, you know, have a lookup table like this, where abandon is encoding the sentiment of sadness. It's encoding just a general negative emotion or a fear. And what you can do is you can roll through all the words and you can tally up the sentiment counts for all the words in there. And then you can come up with a score for a given 
comment, and maybe that comment, that YouTube comment, therefore is going to go above a threshold where we say, this is highly charged anger words. There's loads of anger words in there. The, the percentage of anger is so high that we want to automatically flag this as a potential, um, you know, abusive comment. And we're going to uh, send it maybe to a human for labeling, for final labeling, or maybe we're going to, you know, just assume it's a good, anything at 99% anger is definitely an abusive comment. And we're just going to put it in the training set. Okay. What's the problems with this step, right? Is that it may not necessarily encode all of the beautiful context of language. Right? Abandon may have a connotation of negativity in general, but it turns out that there's a usage where it doesn't have a negative connotation, and that is to, uh, to jump around with wild abandon, which you know is kind of a semi-poetic, highfalutin way of saying, abandon your inhibitions and have fun, right? So they danced with abandon is something maybe that would be a little bit more colloquial, right? abandoning your inhibitions. Sounds joyful to me, not negative at all. So context can defeat this kind of approach quite badly. And clearly, you know, the problem that I laid out is super complex. And it's got all these moving parts. And what I did just now was to walk you through a very fast set of ideas which I don't want you to necessarily retain, right? This is not about natural language processing YouTube comments. This whole section is just about what kinds of crap can you run into when you're trying to actually do a machine learning project, realizing that overall the, error, the whole nature of measurements, right, is a hard thing at, to uh, deal with. You know, your, your systems might be quite noisy, your systems might have proxy measurements, things like, you know, or we're trying to get at the meaning of words, but we're stuck with a bunch of algorithms to try to infer the meaning of words, which don't really capture it because language is a flexible and difficult con context driven thing, right? So we need to know that the things we're measuring are what we really mean to be measuring and maybe think more deeply about whether the measurements that we're putting into our system are the ones we really want. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to stop here and uh, you know, we're gonna do the little short sessions again and I will see you again in just a few minutes for part two.